I'm going to make a bet now. And I bet that you can get any car with a combustion engine inside it. Something like this, for example, from point A to point B using nothing but pure electrical power coming from the car itself. And that is without modifying it, without pushing it, and without using a single drop of fuel or emitting a single gram of CO2. You're probably thinking of betting against me now because what I'm saying sounds impossible and you're also probably thinking that I lost my mind or something. Well, if you were to actually bet against me, you would lose. And this is because what I just said is true and I can prove it and you can also try it for yourself, although I definitely do not recommend that you try it yourself. And this is how you do it. Pop the hood, disconnect the spark plugs, get inside your car, put it in gear, don't step on any of the pedals, and crank the engine. And voila, your car is moving from point A to point B on nothing but pure electrical power. Just like a Tesla. Of course, it's very stupid to do this and you shouldn't do this because it puts an enormous strain uh, on your starter motor and it's likely going to fry it and it's probably going to drain your battery. So this is why I said don't do it. It's also kind of unsafe. So again, don't do it. It's also impossible without some basic modifications to do this in newer cars because newer cars force you uh, to press the clutch in to crank the engine. Also, this whole bet is based on the fact that we haven't defined the distance from point A to point B. My bet only works if the distance from point A to point B is left undefined because it's very, very short. Your car can do maybe a couple of you know, meters before the starter dies or the battery drains. So, but that all being said, you can do this with an older petrol car. And why did I even make this stupid bet? What's the point of all this? Well, the point is that I wanted to make a point. The point is that combustion cars inside them have the very same basic components that electric vehicles also have inside them. And that is a battery and an electric motor. Of course, they're used in completely different ways in combustion engine cars and electric vehicles. But today we want to explore the differences between these two types of cars in detail and do it objectively and thoroughly and see their strengths and weaknesses and how they stack against each other in the real world. Now, many of us are familiar with how an ICE or an internal combustion engine works, but we really aren't yet on a first name basis with EVs or electric vehicles. But this is where my stupid little bet from before comes in. It demonstrated, as we already said, that although fundamentally different, these two types of vehicles share the two key components of an electric motor and a battery. And by relying on this principle, we are first going to better understand EVs a bit because we need to familiarize ourselves with EVs before we can get them clashing head to head with ICE vehicles. And we can learn about the unfamiliar by re-examining the familiar. It's going to be fun and easy. So let's start with the familiar, the ICE or the internal combustion engine. As we know, it's not self-starting, which means that we somehow need to get it started in order to get our vehicle moving. We need to initiate the first combustion event, which then drives the next combustion event and so on and so forth. Now, in the early days, this was done manually with a crank handle. You would attach a crank handle onto the engine and spin it and hopefully start your engine. Of course, this was not only very difficult, it was also kind of dangerous and many people dislocated their shoulders or even broken their jaws trying to start their car. And necessity is the mother of all invention, so soon we evolved past crank handles and started using electricity to start combustion engines. And so today we start our engines by using a starter motor. Now, just like any electrical motor, the starter motor turns electrical energy into mechanical work. The electrical energy comes, of course, from the car's battery. And although it is a lot smaller than the battery of an EV, it works on the same basic principle of storing chemical energy and converting it into electrical energy. When you turn the key inside your car, you allow electricity to flow from the battery to the starter motor. And when the starter motor receives electricity, the little gear on it meshes with the feet on your flywheel and it turns the engine until combustion starts. 
Now just like the battery, the starter motor of an ICE vehicle is going to be of course a lot smaller than the electric motor of an EV. Although it must be said that EV motors are impressively small and compact for what they're capable of doing. Now let's learn more about EV motors by looking at them in contrast to starter motors of ICE vehicles. Now both starter motors and EV motors have two main working components, the stator and the rotor. And as the names imply, the stator is the stationary part and the rotor is the rotating part of the motor. And both the starter motor and the EV motor work by relying on the same basic fundamental principle of electromagnetism, which tells us that a current traveling through a wire is going to create a magnetic field along the axis of that wire. But there's a catch here. The starter motor and the EV motor need different kinds of currents to run. The starter motor is a DC or direct current motor with brushes and commutators. The brushes must make direct physical contact for the starter motor to operate. On the other hand, the EV motor is a three phase induction motor which needs AC or alternating current to operate and it has no brushes or commutators. Typically the brushes and commutators are a wear item and the brushes are the first thing to fail on a DC motor and they also limit uh, speed and life expectancy. And this is why usually you're going to find DC motors in household appliances, although there of course are exceptions to this. And AC motors and induction motors are typically found in industrial appliances. When it comes to DC motors, the main current is sent into the rotor. And this is why in the rotor you're going to find the main coil winding. When electricity comes through this coil winding, it creates a magnetic field. And this magnetic field then reacts either with a permanent magnet or another field winding in the stator, causing the rotor to turn. The AC induction motor is different. The main current isn't sent into the rotor, it's sent into the stator and the stator has three separate coil windings. When alternating current is sent into these three separate coil windings, it creates something interesting. It creates a rotating magnetic field. This rotating magnetic field then induces a current in the rotor, and then the rotor creates its own rotating magnetic field, and these two magnetic fields react against each other, forcing the rotor to turn. And this is where the induction motor gets its name from. Induction, because the current is induced in the rotor. There's no direct contact and this is why AC induction motors don't need brushes or commutators and this is why typically they're more rugged, more reliable, more powerful and also have a much longer life expectancy when compared to DC motors. Now you can find induction motors in many Tesla vehicles, for example, although they have been and are increasingly being replaced by something called IPM Syn RM, which stands for Internal Permanent Magnet Synchronous Reluctance Motor, which as you can see from the name does have permanent magnets in it, unlike induction motors. For example, the Porsche Taycan has a motor with permanent magnets in it, as well as do some entry-level EVs. Now the actual differences between IPM Syn RM and induction motors is a topic for an entirely separate video, but for now, if you're being confused of all this talk of reluctance and synchronous motors and electromagnetic fields, don't worry, you of course do not have to memorize any of this. For the sake of our comparison of EVs and uh, ICE vehicles, the only thing you really have to remember is that both induction motors and IPMSCRM motors are very reliable, very rugged, very compact and lightweight. They're also very simple and require a little to know maintenance and perhaps most importantly of all they have rotation at their very core. So now that we better understand or at least a bit better understand EVs we can stop comparing EV motors to starter motors because starter motors aren't what drive ICE vehicles of course. They just start that which does the engine. <laughs> The biggest downside of the internal combustion engine is that it has to convert reciprocation 
into rotation. This is where most of its complexity, weight, vibrations, friction and efficiency losses come from. As we know, pistons move up and down. But to drive the wheels we don't need reciprocation, we need rotation. And converting the pistons violent up and down motion into smooth rotation is the arduous task of the connecting rods, the crankshaft and the flywheel. Compared to this, the electric motor has to convert nothing into rotation. It, as we already said, has rotation in its core. It's already rotating by its nature, which is why, compared to the internal combustion engine, the electric motor is essentially vibration-free. It's also a lot lighter and a lot more compact. The only internal combustion engine that can compare to the electric motor when it comes to vibration free and smooth running and lightness and compactness is the rotary or the Vankel engine. It too has rotation in its core, but unfortunately it has some big downside in terms of efficiency and emissions, which is why it never really became as widespread as the reciprocating piston engine. Also, all of this being said, presenting the internal combustion engine is something that inherently vibrates and is very uncomfortable is kind of unfair. Modern engines have more than a century of evolution behind them and most modern engines made in the past, I don't know, 30, 40, maybe even 50 years don't really vibrate that much and occupants of modern vehicles when they're working properly will have a hard time feeling any sort of very noticeable vibrations. Also, engine configurations like the inline 6 or the V12 for example are essentially vibration free. You can start these engines with a coin placed on its side on the engine and the coin will stay there when you turn the key. So, again, presenting the internal combustion engine as something that inherently vibrates a lot is a bit misleading. Something else that's a bit misleading here is the weight. Yes, the electric motor of an EV does by itself weigh less than a fully assembled combustion engine, but there's more to it. To run to drive a car, the combustion engine only needs a liquefied dinosaurs, which is fuel in the fuel tank and a transmission. Together, these things weigh maybe, I don't know, 100 to 250 kilograms, depending on the vehicle class. On the other hand, to drive a vehicle, an electric motor needs batteries. It needs a lot of batteries. For example, the battery pack in the Tesla Model S weighs a whopping 500 kilograms. Also, batteries output DC power, which is great for powering DC motors, which is why you can basically run a cable straight from a battery to your starter motor. But if we recall, the electric motors in EVs need three-phase AC power. So how do we convert the DC power coming from the batteries into AC power for the electric motor. That is the task of this space age looking thing right here, which is the inverter, which is another integral part of every EV. So if we add things up, we can see that a combustion engine needs fuel, fuel tank, transmission, while an EV needs battery pack plus inverter. And if we add these things up, we're going to see that on average, EVs are going to weigh some 100 to 350 kilograms more than an equivalent combustion engine vehicle. Luckily, all those heavy batteries are always on the floor, which is great for both handling and safety. As you probably know, we control the speed of petrol engines by controlling the throttle, and we control the speed of diesel engines by controlling the amount of fuel injected into the engine. How do we control the speed of an electric motor? As you might know, the DC motor in your car is a single speed, a constant speed motor. It's either on or off. When you turn on the key, the motor starts, it runs at a single speed until the engine starts and then it stops. That's it. The only way to control the speed of a DC motor is to control the voltage. You might have heard this sound once or twice. When your battery is kind of drained, then you can hear your starter motor clanking the engine very slowly. You have a sound that tells you you're gonna be late for work. Of course, a single speed motor would be completely unsuitable to drive the wheels of a car. Fortunately, AC motors found in EVs have a key advantage over DC motors when it comes to speed control. To control the speed of an AC motor, you do not need to manipulate the voltage. The only thing you have to do is alter the frequency of the alternating current going into the AC motor. And this is the other key task of the inverter. It converts DC into AC and then it manipulates the frequency of the AC to change the speed of the AC 
motor. So let's recall this little table from just a few moments ago. As you can see, there's no transmission listed for EVs. Does this mean that the inverter is capable of controlling the frequency of the AC current to an extent that EVs do not need transmissions? Actually, no. EVs need transmissions too. So EVs need transmissions too, yes, but their transmissions are dramatically less complex than those found on ICE vehicles. As we have seen, EVs are kinda heavy, and to get them moving, we need quite a bit of torque, and getting this torque is the task of the transmission. But EV transmissions are usually single speed, one gear, extremely simple, and the task of this single speed transmission is to gear down the very high RPMs coming from the electric motor and to increase the torque output of the electric motor. It might even be a bit more accurate to not call these things transmissions, instead to call them gear reduction units or maybe torque multiplication units. You know, doesn't matter. The transmissions inside the Tesla Model S, for example, are either 9.7 to 1 or 9.3 to 1 gear ratio depending on the Tesla Model S model, which means that for every 9.7 rotations of the electric motor, the wheels turn once and the torque is multiplied 9.7 times by the time it gets to the wheels. If we compare ICE transmissions to this, we will see that they are dramatically more complex. They usually have five or six or even more gears in some cases, and the gear ratios are pretty different, usually something like this, for example. So why is this the case? How can an EV get away with just one gear while ICE vehicles need so many? To understand why EVs can use just one gear transmissions and why ICE vehicles need many more, we have to analyze their respective torque curves. Now, if you read articles or watch videos that compare EVs and ICE vehicles, you're often going to hear how EVs have a flat torque curve and how ICE vehicles make peak torque over only a narrow RPM range. Now, the reality is that both of these statements are exaggerations. Here's the torque curve of a Tesla Model S. As you can see, it is definitely not flat. And here's something that videos that want to teach you about EVs often show as a typical ICE vehicle torque curve. This used to be a torque curve of a vehicle made 20 to 30 years ago that was naturally aspirated and probably low powered as well. I believe in educating without downplaying, so here's the torque curve of something modern that costs roughly as much as the Tesla Model S. As you can see, the torque curve definitely does not look like a mountain and is beautifully flat. But if you believe that you need to spend north of $100,000 to get a flat torque curve in a modern ICE vehicle, here's something different. This costs less than half of the Tesla Model S or the BMW M5. This is the torque curve of the Focus RS, and as you can see, it makes peak torque from very, very low in the RPM range, and it maintains this peak torque for most of the RPM range. My point is, Modern vehicles have beautifully flat torque curves, and anyone who has driven a modern, especially forced induction ICE vehicle, has probably realized that there is no real world scenario where you feel like you're missing torque. But to put things into perspective and understand why EVs can use just one gear, we need to merge torque curves. But before we uh, merge torque curves, we have to take a closer look at the Tesla Model S torque curve. As you can see, there's something a bit weird about it. At the bottom, there's miles per hour instead of RPMs. But luckily, because we have just one gear in the transmission, we can simply replace miles per hour with motor RPM. And now we can merge in the BMW M5 torque curve. Uh, into this same chart. And I'm sure some of you can already tell why EVs can get away with just one gear. As you can see, they have absolutely gigantic RPM range, 18,000 RPM. This is Formula One territory, but unlike a Formula One, EVs make usable torque over their entire RPM range. Compared to this, the ICE, despite the flat torque curve, cannot cover all the speed ranges. If it had just one gear, you would be redlining at 60 miles per hour and the car would be useless. Something else really interesting that we can observe here is at the very beginning of the torque curve. As you can see, the EV has 
peak torque from zero RPM. This is something that an ICE engine cannot do regardless of the amount of power or turbos or gear ratio or whatever. This instant torque is an incredible sensation and it is one of the reasons why vehicles like the Tesla Model S have such unparalleled acceleration. Interestingly enough, the reason why the torque peaks at zero RPM is the same reason why it starts falling off at higher motor speeds. And the reason is back EMF or electromagnetic field. This is a counter electromotive force, which is a force that opposes the change in current which induced it. In other words, it's an electromagnetic field that opposes the initial electromagnetic field. The faster the motor spins, the stronger the back EMF, which slows down the motor and reduces its torque. But there's a downside to this whole single speed transmission thing. With only one gear ratio, you're forced to compromise. You can either choose a gear ratio that favors acceleration or top speed. The Tesla Model S, for example, obviously chose to favor acceleration. This is why it destroys pretty much everything from zero to 100 miles per hour. But from 100 miles per hour to 150 miles per hour, many combustion cars with comparable power will outrun the Tesla Model S. And the reason is that ICE vehicles have transmissions with multiple gear ratios and manufacturers can simply choose a gear ratio that favors acceleration for the first four gears and then choose uh, gear ratios that favor top speed, high speed performance for the fifth and sixth gear, for example. The reason uh, why the Porsche Taycan, for example, went with a two speed transmission is exactly to avoid this kind of compromise. The transmission in the Porsche Taycan automatically shifts at around 45 miles per hour to enable both brutal acceleration and great high-speed performance. And this is why even though the Porsche Taycan is a bit heavier and has a bit less power than the Tesla Model S, it actually outruns this car. In fact, the Porsche Taycan is currently the only modern EV with a two-speed transmission. So why didn't the Tesla and other manufacturers go with a two-speed transmission as well? Well, the reason is that instant torque at zero RPM, that massive torque of all down. It's an absolute gear cruncher. It destroys transmissions. It eats them for breakfast. This is a lesson that Tesla had to learn the hard way with their proof of concept uh, Roadster car, their first car and this is why they decided to settle on a much simpler much more robust single speed transmission with minimal moving parts to avoid these problems also there's a flip side to all of this and there is a bit of a downside to the instant torque and there is a bit of an upside to the gradual torque of ice vehicles and you realize this when you try to drive an EV hard through corners. Many driving enthusiasts have described the feeling as an on-off sensation and somewhat unpleasant as if you're trying to drive an RC car through corners. Although the EV cars were fast through corners, the sensation was off. It was very difficult to maintain a smooth cornering fall on a twisty road. Of course, this isn't the case with the gradual torque of an ICE vehicle. Often the shifting of gears required in ICE vehicles is presented as a downside, but in reality, this is what enables enjoyable and engaging driving for many. People that like to get on the EV hype bandwagon often like to say that EVs are basically maintenance free. I've had four to five Teslas. Guess how many oil changes I've had? Zero. Yes, you do get rid of engine oil changes, but many, many servicing items still remain, which means that EVs are definitely not maintenance free. You still have brakes, which means you need to replace pads and discs and braking fluid. You also have coolant and coolant pumps and radiators for the batteries. You have a bunch of motors, windshield wiper motors, power steering motors, window motors. You also have really complex electronics that can fail and may require specialized attention. You also have batteries that decay over time and must be replaced. You have a gearbox that has oil in it and maybe even an oil pump or even an oil filter. And there's a bunch of things that need to be serviced because the reality is that humans are currently and will likely be long in the future unable to make a car that is maintenance free regardless of powertrain. A car has many many moving parts and everything that moves can and will eventually either wear out or fail.
That being said, an EV does promise less maintenance than a combustion car because a combustion car, in addition to having pretty much everything an EV has, also has a lot more stuff like clutches, flywheels, oil pumps, water pumps, fuel pumps, injectors, ignition coils, timing belts or timing chains, and more gaskets than you can count. I probably forgot like half of this stuff. But despite of this, uh, if we look at owner satisfaction surveys and satisfaction ratings when it comes to vehicle quality and maintenance, it doesn't seem that at this point in time, EVs have on average done any better than combustion cars. And EVs, just like combustion cars, are a mixed bag. Some did better than others, but we have to remember that combustion cars have a century of evolution behind them. Engineers had a lot of time to perfect combustion cars and make them very reliable despite there are very many, many moving parts. Compared to this, modern mass-produced EVs are a relatively newfangled thing, and they do have the opportunity to get a lot better in the future and outdo combustion cars when it comes to maintenance. So what about running costs? Surely it must be a lot cheaper to run an EV because electricity is a lot cheaper than fuel. Well, actually, it depends on where you live. This is the price of electricity in Qatar. This is the price, the average price of charging station electricity in Germany. So based on this, this is how much it costs to fill up the 100 kilowatt hour batteries of the Tesla SP100D. For comparison sakes, here's the price of fuel in Germany and Qatar and how much it costs to fill up a combustion vehicle with a 50 liter fuel tank. So Qatar is EV heaven, right? Well, actually no, because fuel prices are still kind of low in Qatar, EV incentives are also very low, and there's very few charging stations, unfortunately. But these are just two examples, and actually there's some countries where owning an EV makes a lot of sense. For example, Netherlands. Cheap electricity, expensive fuel, many, many, many charging stations. So running costs, all in all, it really depends on where you live and what kind of taxation and registration as well as EV incentive policies your country has. Now, one of the key reasons why I made this video is to offer a more complete response to a certain type of comment that I seem to be getting quite often from a certain population of viewers. After getting these comments for a relatively long time, I started noticing a pattern, and I dubbed these commenters electro-evangelists. They usually drop by my videos, which as you know are mostly about internal combustion engines, and they leave a comment saying something like, Ice is useless, stupid, dirty, smelly, horrible, uh, EVs are the future, and I can't believe somebody is still wasting time talking about internal combustion engines. Now, I don't mean to insult anybody, although I am kind of being insulted by these comments myself, but these comments are extremely naive and kind of rude and annoying also. Now for my response to these comments. First of all, when it comes to the future, what the future is, is anybody's guess. Predicting the future is currently impossible, regardless of technological or financial input into said endeavor. When it comes to the present, our world is still, for better or worse, driven by internal combustion engines. Combustion has built our world and shaped our lives, and continues to do so. Calling the combustion engine ugly, horrible, useless, smelly, dirty, etc. is very naive and also an insult to humanity, because the combustion engine is one of humanity's greatest inventions. An incredible amount of effort and engineering genius has gone into perfecting the combustion engine so that it can safely, quickly and comfortably bring you to school, so that it can bring you food, so that it can save lives, so that it can bring you joy and excitement, so that it can take you around the world and do many, many more things like enlighten and educate many generations of humans. So let's not be ungrateful and spoiled. Yes, we should always look to the future, but no, we should not forget where we are and where we came from. The other reason why I made this video is to try and address the really high amount of pigeonholing or even racism that seems to exist in this whole EV versus ICE debate. I realized this exists when I found out that most of my friends and acquaintances had great prejudice when it comes to my opinion on EVs. As you know, I am a petrolhead and yes, I do enjoy internal 
combustion engines. I love them. I love working around them, assembling them, talking about them. But because of this, nine out of 10 people seem to think that I hate EVs and that I want them to fail and that I think internal combustion should rule for all eternity. Just to set the record straight, yes, I am a petrohead. No, I do not hate EVs because of this. I am genuinely and honestly excited about EVs and I find them amazing and incredible. I am a human and I really like to breathe and I'm really looking forward to cleaner air and reduced emissions in the future. But I'm also aware of the fact that cars are only a piece of the puzzle of our giant carbon footprint and that the environmental implications of EVs are still very much unexplored. Also the infrastructure for EVs might be there already in California and the Netherlands for example, but it isn't there in Eastern or Southeastern Europe, Africa, many parts of Asia, Russia and so on and it's not going to pop up overnight. Also combustion engines are likely going to be a choice for off-road travel long into the future because you can bring spare fuel canisters with you but you really can't bring spare batteries or set up mini solar stations in the middle of nowhere. Also the fact that I'm currently playing with internal combustion engines and building them and enjoying them doesn't mean that I won't stuff batteries into something tomorrow and have fun with that because I really enjoy all forms of propulsion and anything that gives you freedom to go wherever you please. We must realize that the amazing thing here is that EVs are being compared to ICE vehicles. ICE vehicles have more than a century of evolution behind them, while compared to this, EVs are just in their embryonic stage. And it's really amazing that even at this embryonic stage, they are punching far above their weight and giving ICE vehicles a run for their money in some parts of the world. The final reason why I made this video is that I'm a bit surprised by the lack of enthusiasm for EVs from some parts of the car enthusiast community. Perhaps this is where my friends get their prejudice from, I really don't know, but some petroheads seem to think that EVs are the end of enthusiasm and the beginning of a super boring, self-driving, nerdy future. Guess what? That couldn't be further from the truth. Electricity is simply opening new and exciting doors for us and we have many reasons to be thrilled by this. Even in this embryonic stage people are building absolutely amazing stuff on the DIY and the aftermarket is also already responding. Companies like AEM, for example, are building really incredible advanced vehicle control units, power distribution units, and digital dashboards that greatly simplify and improve EV conversions. And they're behind some really incredible and exciting record-breaking builds. I put a bunch of links in the description down below so you can check all of that out. And also you have companies that are offering tailor-made motor and inverter solutions that allow you to build far more interesting stuff than your generic let's rip out a Tesla drivetrain and bolt it onto something else thing. And all of this is just the beginning. So are EVs the end of enthusiasm? I'll let you be the judge of that one. So to sum it up, are EVs the future? Well, your guess is as good as anybody else's. Are EVs amazing? You bet. Do they have ways to go? Definitely. But that's a good thing. Okay, so that's pretty much it for this gigantic video on this very interesting topic. I hope you enjoyed it and maybe even learned a thing or two in the process. But most of all, I hope it inspires some newfound appreciation for both ICE vehicles and EVs. As always, thanks a lot for watching and I'll be seeing you soon with more fun and useful stuff on the D4A channel.